Mr. Paragre, thank you so much for joining me uh, today on uh, the Core Report Weekend Edition and also connecting the dots. So, uh, let me uh, pose a couple of broader questions to you uh, from the India context and, and the global uh, situation. So, firstly, in India, we are seeing uh, merchandise exports now fall. It fell 22% year-on-year to about $33 billion in June. Now, this is uh, contracting consistently for five months now. Now, this has been, of course, driven partly by or maybe largely by a decline in commodity prices. So, that's affecting us, but that's also helping us elsewhere because input costs for companies are going down, margins are better, consumers are benefiting and so on. But I am coming back to trade. Now, with our own role in trade seemingly going down because we are obviously, uh, the value of exports is going down, where do we stand as India? But in the context of maybe a larger global landscape of trade at this point, given two or three things, and then I'll stop uh, with this long question. One is, of course, our, uh, the geopolitical situation in a broad sense. That's the, let's say, from an India point of view, again, India, China, and the United States. And second is, of course, the uh, the, the Ukraine-Russia uh, war and the impact that uh, it's had on so many things. So, uh, yeah, so that's really the, the foundation for what I would like you to touch upon and start perhaps with the trade landscape as you see it in a global context and then on to India. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Govindaraj. My pleasure to be with you. Uh, okay, so let me begin with the question. Now, you know, um, uh, on the falling exports, uh, let me say that, you know, uh, I look at these uh, figures uh, in a much longer term context, uh, monthly uh, figures can see a decline. And in this case, of course, you have yourself provided a good explanation that the commodity prices have been declining and that uh, would uh, impact the value uh, of exports as also of value of imports. Uh, so most likely, you know, what we are, would also observe is that the value of imports would be correspondingly declining as well. Um, to me, the it, it is the longer term uh, prospects uh, that worry the most uh, or that concern me the most. Um, now, to uh, uh, where we stand, you know, how do I see uh, this unfold? Um, uh, first of all, uh, uh, you know, a common concern, of course, is expressed about uh, what is going on geopolitically and more generally on the global markets. Um, that part I have always maintained is to me not a big source of worry. Uh, for the following reason. Uh, I'll come to geopolitics in a minute, but but first, you know, uh, what has been the kind of very recent history? Uh, if I look at these longer term trends, uh, uh, you know, pre-COVID uh, uh, peak of global total exports was in 2018. And that was a figure of uh, about $19 trillion uh, total global exports uh, 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 that is for the merchandise, uh, and uh, then there was six trillion dollars of services exports again. So took all together twenty five trillion dollars uh, uh, pre COVID peak in the year two thousand eighteen. Now look at year two thousand twenty two. By year two thousand twenty two, which you know is coming out of COVID and all, and yet uh, 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 the merchandise exports have bumped up to, to about twenty five trillion dollars from uh, 19 trillion uh, and services exports have bumped up from 6 trillion to 7 trillion. So now the global marketplace uh, at, at total exports is about uh, at 32 trillion dollars compared with uh, what was uh, uh, you know about 25 trillion dollars. So it is a large economy, uh, it is a large market uh, uh, compared to you know compare that to India's GDP for example. This, about $3.4 trillion now uh, in, in the year 22, 23. Uh, and, and so there, uh, you know, no matter how one uh, likes to kind of look at the geopolitics, politics, et cetera, the one fact that, is, that remains to me is that the global marketplace, even if it were to decline by some, you know, uh, 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 5, 10% in the years to come, it will remain a very large marketplace. So what uh, really matters is how uh, large a slice of that large, that very large pie India is able to get for itself. Currently, it's very small. In the exports, we are about 1.8% our share in the global exports. 
On import side, we are about 2.5%, a little over 2.5%. That's for merchandise. Uh, services, we are about 4% uh, of the total global exports. So uh, there is enormous scope. But, you know, compare that to the China, which is about 13 to 14% for merchandise exports. Services, China is larger than us, but not much larger. Uh, so that is where we stand. I think, you know, on enormous scope. So uh, 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 now, if, you know, we can talk about uh, Ukraine, Russia, if you wish, and, and, and also in uh, US, China. Yeah, so we'll come to Ukraine, Russia in a little bit. So uh, the, what you're saying is that uh, the overall trade pie, that's the global trade pie, has grown. Uh, but it seems to me that uh, shares have again shifted around. So India perhaps does not have the same share it even had in 2018. Was that Would that be correct? Uh, no, I think we're about where we were. So it's 1.8. We have not exceeded 1.8. And that's roughly where we stand currently. Yeah, so for the year 2023. Right, so so India has not grown in this pie, but has maintained the same share. So so why is that? I mean, broadly. Well, this is where I think you know our internal policies are still uh, 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 not fully uh, uh, conducive to rapid growth in exports. Uh, I think we are decent, but but not conducive to to rapid growth. What is missing is uh, one. Uh, you know, 2018, uh, we had raised a lot of the, the custom duties, uh, and uh, many of these even include many inputs, you know, that go into the production of the final products and so forth. So that naturally uh, uh, works towards uh, 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 reducing trade, uh, meaning, you know, although these are duties on imports and you might think that uh, you know, reduction in imports is not going to impact exports, but it doesn't work that way. At the end of the day, when you try to expand exports, resources flow out of somewhere, and that somewhere is also the export industries. Uh, and and therefore, you know, it, 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 regardless of uh, you know, even though you're restricting imports, it also means restriction, restricting the exports. Uh, so that's one factor at work. The second is the exchange rate. You know, I still think that you know our exchange rate rupee is a bit overvalued. Uh, uh, some correction has happened. Uh, but we need a bit more correction. Uh, uh, and, and to me, I think the exchange rate is absolutely critical. Uh, you look at any country which has uh, done well on exports, you know, expanding rapidly at uh, uh, paces of 15%, 18% a year on a sustained basis. Uh, these are countries which keep the domestic currency very competitive. Uh, and, and we have consistently kind of uh, 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 a bit uh, overvalued the, the rupee. Uh, so, so that is the other major factor, I think. You know, and the third, of course, you know, we need to do more free trade agreements. Uh, that is for looking uh, ahead. Yeah, and and you've talked about this in the past as well. I think you've said basically that we should roll back tariffs because after many many years since we started in ninety one, uh, we've actually now uh, increased the level of protection, as you pointed out. You also said that you know one should uh, strike more free trade deals uh, with major economies and trade blocks, and also cut back on anti dumping. So. Anyway, anti-dumping is something that is maybe more situational. But are you also linking the uh, the our, let's say, static share in world trade with our increase in tariffs or protectionism? Uh, I, I would say, well, look, you know, uh, the, the, the level of the share, right? You know, the, the, the level itself as opposed to how it changes over time uh, is also a function of the economy size. Uh, uh, you know, we are still 3.4 trillion dollar economy. We are not, you know, China is four times us. So, you know, remember that even with the same exports to GDP ratio for India, if GDP were to become four times, then our exports would also be at, at the same exports to GDP ratio be four times of what they are. And that, of course, means 1.8 times four. Uh, it's not quite eight percent, but it's close, close to about seven percent. Uh, so, so, so the economic size also matters for the level. So we, you know, we we shouldn't be, but still, you know, even if we do that correction, we are well below China's. <laughs> and and there, of course, you know, the 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 old impact, you know, of uh, 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 the 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 policies we followed starting from the 1950s, they're still remaining because one of the the, the, the you know the other. Um, my favorite theme is that uh, we have not reoriented, restructured the economy towards uh, the factor which is uh, most abundant in our country, which is labor. 
mean china was very quick in the 80s and uh, by mid 90s you know uh, to reorient its entire economy from this heavy industry capital intensive industries towards the labor intensive industries we have not successfully done that we were so slow you know till as late as mid uh, 2000s mean in 2005 6 we had still not not knocked down completely the small scale industries reservation which is where the labor intensive industries were s- sitting uh then we have not done the labor laws still you know all the 2019 we passed all the four codes but we have not uh, implemented them they have not been notified yet so as a result if you look at our economic structure this heavily capital intensive or skilled labor intensive what are the successful industries you know you got petroleum refining you got machinery industry you got chemical industry you got pharmaceutical industry you got it industry you got finance uh, industry they all either skilled labor intensive or capital intensive we are not making use of the big factor of production you got which is the labor and and that is the 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 reason we are not as export oriented as as china was in uh, or has been so i i i'm, I'm going to come to that in a moment but my previous question you know so you're saying that there is no real linkage between our ability to grow or not grow in the global trade pie uh and uh the level of import tariffs that we have or the level of protection that we now imposed on ourselves no 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 that's not what i'm saying of course the, the tariffs do matter tariffs do matter but uh, does that but, make uh, us but, more uncompetitive does that make us less of yes. in the international market is my question yeah 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 look i mean it's very simple it's very simple let's think of the extreme suppose you were to raise the tariffs to a level where your imports are zero there will be no reason to export there will be absolutely no reason to export that is what we did for about 4 5 decades pre 1991 i mean if you go to 1970 imports were 4% of the gdp exports were therefore even less than 4% of the gdp uh, so uh, absolutely you know that uh, of course the level of protection makes a big huge difference right so that's i think that's a that's a very good illustration for a student like me so uh let let me come to the point about uh, the labor uh, labor uh, linked industries and growth there so again this is an issue that you've talked about in the past as well i think the question is really where we are today uh i think uh, you know so i i if i may quote a article that appeared in the economist and it talks about the manufacturing delusion and essentially it argues that uh, you know countries like uh, india and china the industry share of economic output has been roughly or is is has been roughly the same uh, or rather is roughly the same today as it was about 3 decades ago that's one second is uh, even in the west it was about uh, 19% in 1997 it's down to about 7 uh, 16% today uh, we're talking about uh, manufacturing so if that's the case i mean that's assuming you agree with this proposition what is the is is manufacturing or labor linked manufacturing the way out Uh, at this point of time as we uh, speak today yeah you know so there is a lot of this skepticism you, you know first of all of course you know the uh, 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 if you look at the western economies they are highly capital abundant economies they have no reason to be doing i mean they're not even doing as much manufacturing as china or uh, uh, south korea or, uh, or taiwan are doing uh, but uh, 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 for them to do labor intensive manufacturing of course is not is neither here nor there uh and so their manufacturing share being low uh, uh it uh, being at the level where we are uh, of course uh, it tells me nothing at all okay uh, i have to compare myself to the labor abundant economies uh, i can look at where korea was you know let's say in 1980 or 1970 or i can look at where taiwan was or i can look at where singapore was uh, uh, at at one point or where china has been uh, in last three four decades so if i compare with that i am well below their levels uh, uh, in my share of manufacturing in the gdp uh, and 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 i return to the uh, uh, theme that uh, uh, in the end it all has to do with the fact that we uh, started as did china of course initially in the 1950s with very heavy industry kind of approach to uh, development uh, china got out of it after then shopping came along uh, uh, we started in 91 but you know we we did open up the industries and so growth did happen a lot faster than it had happened before but we did not restructure the economy because a lot of the other regulation remained in place 
uh, and 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 you know, so so you can't become. I mean, you can't be in the industries in which g- genuinely your factor endowments are not pushing you towards comparative advantage. With a set of distortions that had existed from the past, which has left you there. So you're not going to become a gigantic exporter in those products, but your scope really remains still with such a large labor force. But you know, the thing is that in the psyche of everybody. Whether I look at the businessmen in India, whether I look at the policymakers in India, whether I look at intellectuals in India, they all want to do the high tech stuff. They all want to do high tech stuff. You know, the, the the industries like the clothing industry, the footwear industry, the furniture industry, the you know everyday light manufacturers, the kitchenware that we use. Every you know, they are not on at least our leadership's minds. But in the end, you know, if you look at the Chinese exports from the 80s and 90s, that is what they exported. The electronics, even the electronics industry, which is also relatively more labor intensive, arrived in more like you know late 1990s, and then it grows very rap- rapidly. You know, in the 2000s, uh, China really explodes. Uh, I mean, you know, say China 2000s, basically China was export was earning every year more to export than now. Then India's level of exports, you know, India's total exports often would fall short of the increase in annual increase in exports of China. So there was a rate, but but the structure was very important. So I remember visiting a toaster factory in Shenzhen uh, in the early 2000s, which uh, I mean, and obviously they made so many toasters that they actually had a percentage of global toaster production and supplying to all the big OEMs, including Philips, Black & Decker, and so on at that time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is that something that's replicable today is is really my question, Mr. Panagrel. Why not? You see, this is a question we repeatedly say, say, or we'll use the expression like this, the ship has sailed or the bus has left or something, you know. <laughs> but but the ship resails all the time. And the bus, le- another bus leaves, the, the, you know. No, at, 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 and I, I, even in the Shenzhen example I quoted, I remember meeting the entrepreneur who ran it, was classically a US returned uh, or Chinese American or American, yeah, Chinese American who had come back to China and had set this up. So in India, there is no shortage of entrepreneurship. Uh, there are many entrepreneurs, maybe let's say uh, a good part of them are attracted to tech industries, but there are many who are not. And as we can see, for example, Right now, in uh, initial public offers on the stock exchanges, we are seeing fairly traditional companies who are uh, raising money and growing and so on. But but these people are not getting into these industries uh, that you speak of. I, I completely agree with you. Actually, you know, Mr. Goyran, I'll tell you, I, whenever I went to speak to CII, uh, occasionally I would sort of, you know, uh, tease them, ask them, you know, who is uh, 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 Harish Auja? Nobody would know who is Harish Aouja. Harish Aouja is the largest single employer in India, you know, about employing about 120,000 people. Uh, I mean, you know, for, for an entrepreneur, is that, I mean, not probably Reliance employs, uh, employs total employs more. But uh, 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 he is the largest exporter, Shahi exports, of clothing uh, from India. Nobody knows who is Harish Aouja, or most of them, you know. And when I only, what I have to tell them is that, you know, uh, his son is married uh, with uh, Sonam Kapoor. Then they quickly connect. Uh, but you know, uh, uh, they, 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 uh, 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 there is something intellectual about in you know, the businessmen also that somehow they, you know, I sometimes actually uh, refer to this as the Brahminical attitude of our businessmen. Businessmen too, uh, that will do machines, will do you know refineries, uh, will do IT industry, but you know. Stitching clothes is not for us. Making shoes is not for us. Uh, something of that sort. Uh, but you've got to change that. But there is a, a policy aspect to that also. I mean, I don't deny that for sure because that's a battle I've been fighting. Uh, that, uh, uh, you know, first that small-scale industries reservation took so long. I mean, believe it or not, the last 20 items on that reservation list went out under Prime Minister Modi. So that's how long it took us for uh, to, to completely get rid of small-scale industry reservation which were all labor-intensive, by the way. They were all labor-intensive. So so we really did a great job of hardwiring our businessmen uh, to keep away from all labor-intensive industries. Uh, then uh, uh, then labor laws still are a problem. Land is still a problem. Now, you know, these are industries, by the way, that operate on very small margins, very highly competitive, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, to survive for Bangladesh uh, uh, clothing industry in, in the market, in the global marketplace is no joke. They, they really have to work. And so these are small margins, small things matter. Electricity prices, if they are overly high, I mean, I talked to Arish Rao, he says he can, he, he would never dream of locating himself in tier one city. He'll always go to tier two or tier three cities because that's where you can do the wages at which you are competitive in the global marketplace. Yeah, uh, so, so he supplies, you know, Arish Rao, the, the Shai export supplies to all the major uh, 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 brand names in clothing industry. But why is it that we have only one Arish Aouzia? <laughs> to get another 20 Arish Aouzias in the country. Uh, and I don't see that, uh, uh, I, I fear. So it's a combination also of the history, the way we hardwired everybody, and uh, the policy. So I'll come to policy. So uh, we've said that, yes, India can have a larger share in the global uh, uh, trade market. We can do that by really injecting more labor into labor-intensive industries for which, uh, as you say, we still have a lot of scope, uh, including in those industries that you pointed out. So let's touch upon the last part, which is the policy. Now, uh, some of the biggest policy boosts right now are happening uh, via productivity-linked incentives, for example, uh, in a variety of industries. But again, uh, as far as I know, none of the ones that you've spoken of. And these PLIs are giving, let's say, electric vehicle manufacturing companies or uh, soon to be maybe pharmaceuticals, uh, air conditioning uh, companies like LG. Uh, they've already, uh, 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 companies like Samsung for devices, they've already started getting PLIs and they're benefiting from it because the production has started and they're able to supply in India. But again, it, none of these uh, PLIs at this point at least seem to be touching the industries that you speak of. Yes. I assume that's, that's, right. that's a key policy input. You're right. I mean, you know, uh, uh, to me, that's not the key policy. I think, you know, to me, uh, fix the labor law. I mean, look, PLI is, is basically a second best that, you know, when the manufacturer comes in, I got this disability, I got that disability. It's a well, you know, we are not going to correct the disability, but we'll give you crutches. And then those crutches are the PLI. Uh, uh, but I think we ought to really remove the, the, the disabilities themselves. Uh, and, and, and that is, you know, uh, 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 labor laws, obviously. But land, land prices have to uh, uh, be, be fi fixed, meaning not fixed, but it's a, it's a sort of series of laws which are a problem, you know. Uh, why is land so expensive? And if anybody is trying to get, you know, assemble even a 50 uh, acres worth of land piece, uh, uh, contiguous pieces of land together, it's a pretty serious challenge for the industry. Uh, 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 and this all goes back to, you know, number of things, you know, first land titles are not well defined, but uh, also very importantly, you, you know, usually uh, these industries uh, want to locate on the periphery of a particular city. Uh, and in the periphery of the city is agricultural land. There has to be conversion of that land into uh, uh, other uses. Uh, uh, and often it's a state, it's, it's a state level issue. Uh, states often are very reluctant to do the conversion because the power of this is it resides with the revenue department of the state government and revenue departments don't want to let go. Uh, uh, that, that power should be transferred to the urban ministry. You know, urban ministry has an interest in urbanization. So they, they will be more willing to you know, do the conversion. But, uh, but there are a number of these uh, land restrictions that keep Indian uh, the land in India incredibly expensive, you know. We use, by the way, you know, uh, on agriculture, we uh, 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 compared to the overall uh, global average, uh, we uh, 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 as a proportion of total land area, uh, we are easily three times of the global uh, 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 average. Uh, so, so a lot of our land is in agriculture actually, uh, and, and not also it is very inefficient agriculture because your half of your farms are less than half hectare. So. What are they going to produce? You know, uh, it can't give uh, uh, living to even five people, uh, a family of five. They have to do other things to make uh, ends meet. Uh, uh, so, so ag agriculture also, this is all links to me because in the end, why are they doing these small little farms? Because they haven't got good job opportunities in the industry and services. If we create good job opportunities in the industry and services, which is through these labor intensive manufacturing activities, they would themselves want to move. I mean, children of the farmers, most of them, want to be in the city. They don't want to be doing the farming, you know, and particularly when the farm is only half hectare or less than one hectare, uh, they would rather do something else. 
So, uh, two more questions. I mean, uh, one, let me pose a domestic one and in some way sort of try and uh, complete the circle. So, we started out by talking about international trade and India's potential role in it. But if you, but that in some ways presumes that we want to have a, a big role uh, in, in international trade and that's an important way out for economic growth. Some, of course, argue uh, against that, saying that that is not as critical and exports are not necessarily the uh, way out of uh, wherever we are or the path to where we want to go. Uh, your comments on that? On <laughs> that? I mean, you know, those of uh, we, we are a totally knowledge-proof society. You see, that's a problem. Uh, but 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 we are not comment-proof. We comment uh, on everything, uh, uh, regardless of our uh, uh, knowledge of history. Uh, how did we get uh, to where we are today? I mean, you know, we were uh, the exports to GDP ratio in 1991 was nine percent or seven percent. I do not even nine. I'm overstating. And and. The growth that happened, you think that happened without exports? I mean, the, 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 our fastest growth is about from 2003 to today. I mean, in, in, in real dollars, uh, my calculations are growth has been about 8% between for the two decades, 2003 to 2022. Uh, 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 and just look at the what is happening to, to exports and what is happening to imports during that period. Why don't they look at it? I mean, we used to be about 0.7% uh, uh, or 0.8% in the market in in the uh, in, in terms of our share in the global economy. So it, it has more than doubled actually to, uh, to 1.8%. And this is happening while GDP is rising. So obviously, it's you know, uh, at peak actually the export GDP ratio had uh, uh, touched about 25%. That was from 7% to uh, today it's more like 19-20%. Uh, so you think we did it without without exports? So this is pure lack of knowledge of history. Right. And uh, anyway, I just wanted to place that there because there is, uh, I, I mean, the, it, this this does come up uh, fairly frequently. So the last point and something I mentioned in the beginning, uh, I talked about the the Russia Ukraine war. So not the war in itself, but uh, uh, really your views on where you see the global trade and economy landscape or the economy and trade landscape in whichever order you would like to uh, put it at this point and looking at the rest of 2023. Yeah. No, I, I, I think we are incredibly well situated. So I'm very upbeat, uh, it, you know, as uh, going forward in the next two or three decades, uh, uh, I expect us to be growing 8% or more in real dollars. Uh, 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 and and, and uh, finally, I think, uh, in, you know, we'll see whether it pans out or not, but I, I'm very optimistic that... Uh, uh, finally, this whole China plus one uh, is coming together in favor of India. You know, now the buzz is all around. Uh, perceptions have changed, and you know, the, even a lot of the Western newspapers and magazines, Economist, Time magazine, this, that, which ha had been so incredibly negative for last eight or nine years, uh, are suddenly, you know, they're not explaining why they are changing. But you can see that all in all their write-ups, uh, I'm beginning to see the change. So, uh, so the buzz is very different uh, uh, today uh, uh, from what it was even two years ago. So, so things uh, and 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 you also see that translating into uh, Apple coming in and a lot of the other manufacturers are coming in. Uh, and and the, you know, finally, also, I'm very glad you know the prime minister has made a big push on uh, the the microchip industry, the se semiconductors and all. That is uh, also somewhere we ought to be. Uh, you know, there's no question. Our factor endowments, our uh, uh, you know, this is also requires uh, a fair bit of labor. It, uh, it, it, it all varies which particular component of uh, that industry we are doing. But certainly, there are parts of there are certain parts of that industry in which we ought to be big players. Uh, so I think this is coming together. Uh, uh, the, the the politics very much is in in our favor uh, uh, because I don't see this reconciliation happening between the U.S. and China. Uh, uh, and and as long as that remains, uh, and and China clearly remains uh, very much uh, 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 you know determined to become first uh, both a regional power, which is the you know the big uh, 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 five hundred pound gorilla uh, in Asia, uh, but also you know uh, in in about ten years time it has the ambition to become number one kind of uh, uh, country, uh, and and that of course uh, uh, simply means that the uh, India is the uh, major country which stands in the way, uh, and the United States see that sees that, and the Europeans see that, 
And so, you know, uh, uh, we geopolitically are incredibly well situated. Uh, we also have a really very, uh, 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 you know, vigilant government in place, uh, 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 very much guarding the interests of India, speaking for the interests of India, uh, and a stable government. Uh, so, you know, uh, 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 very willing to make the changes that need to be made. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, the, the uh, situation from the Indian perspective I see is actually more positive than it has ever been, probably. Right. And, and, uh, and, the, and the larger question, I mean, just before we, uh, we close, is that you're, how are you seeing overall global uh, trade and trade flow trends for the rest of the year or the next couple of years at least? I mean, are you seeing, uh, apart from, uh, you know, some uh, like a war in Russia, Ukraine, which of course has a lot of destabilizing effect, which may have been controlled to some extent now. Uh, do you see things being somewhat conducive to uh, at least a certain level of growth at, at a global level? Yeah, I mean, I, I do not see this slowing down. You know, everybody was predicting that after COVID that somehow, you know, the global economy, you cannot be in, in it. It's very uncertain, this, that, and the other. What happened? I mean, all these supply chain disruptions we're talking about, you know, uh, even the U.S.-China trade is still booming, uh, uh, in spite of all the, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, press to the negative. If you look at the figures, the figures show. So, look, you know, the exporters are a very powerful force. Uh, you know, they, they are determined people. They are, I mean, exporters are basically in their own industry the most successful people. They are the most successful. Uh, 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 and, 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 and therefore... Uh, they find ways to uh, uh, to uh, 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 get their goods out uh, to, to to wherever they need to go. Uh, I mean, look at the oil trade itself. You know, uh, all the embargoes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In the end, what happened? Uh, uh, the, the Russian oil is still flowing everywhere. And then, uh, see, uh, the, thanks to Indian carriers or some Indian well, carriers. Well, many others. It's not, not just Indian, but the policy itself. I mean, you know, the Europeans have, have also designed their policies in such a way that once it uh, comes through India, uh, having been refined into India, then they can buy it. Their own laws also are allowing this. Right. Uh, likewise, Americans, where they needed very critical uh, 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 minerals from China, they never became subject to, uh, or even Russia, actually. You know, there are some critical minerals they get from Russia. They never became subject of uh, the embargo. So, you know, both from policy side as well as the determination of the entrepreneurs, uh, particularly the export-oriented entrepreneurs, uh, will continue, you know, I mean, a lot of uh, tensions in the trading system. I understand that even multilateral trading system, WTO, you know, the, uh, the uh, appellate body is uh, in some stress and all. But uh, uh, at the end of the day, if I look at the trade figures, I, I conclude that for us, for India, the real issue is how well do we continue with our own policy reforms? Uh, not uh, uh, there, there is no reason to worry on account of the marketplace itself. That's a large marketplace. Whether it shrinks a little or whether it grows a little is of far less consequence. It is the total size of that market that matters the most for us. Right. So the marketplace is there. Uh, uh, Indian entrepreneurial spirit is, of course, there. Uh, and maybe a few nudges here and there on the policy front uh, should should uh, uh, wrap it up neatly. On that uh, note, thank you so much, Mr. Panagriya, for joining me. My pleasure, Mr. Goindaraj. Thank you.